Uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is July 13th, 2022, and I call this meeting to order. So uh, just a few updates. The exciting news today is that we have over 20 um, applications that are ready for approval today. Um, this is a new record for us. It really is a, a team effort. Um, you know, thank you, as always, to our, our staff for helping push these through. And thank you to all the applicants for sticking it out. Um, you know, this is, of course, one of the most highly regulated industries in the country. And you know, these applications are not easy to get through. Um, I mentioned last week and at Old Street today that we've done the preliminary review of every outdoor cultivator application. I think Brent will show you the chart later on. Um, there are currently a number of outdoor cultivation applications that are incomplete um, or have been in resubmitted status. Um, and they're waiting, awaiting our final review. Um, but this getting through these outdoor cultivators really is a top priority for the board. For the board, um, we have uh, moved on to reviewing the mixed tier applications as well. Um, if this is the license you're seeking, hang in there, um, and please keep your eye out for any communications from the board. Um, we've gotten a few questions about our market projections and how, um, now that we've actually started licensing people, um, how accurate they are. Um, I mentioned last week that the original economist who developed the model is going to be plugging in our data um, to help give a snapshot of how the market is taking shape. Um, you know, we'll do that, you know, publicly in a, in a meeting. Um, and we use that data really to determine things like, um, where backlogs might be developing um, and um, where, you know, if we need to open our kind of larger license types or create new license types. So it's an important tool for us. Um, I would say that the cultivation numbers right now look pretty good. Um, we've had a tremendous amount of buy-in from small cultivators, but also cultivators at all um, tiers. Um, I did some back of the envelope calculations with respect to how much canopy we would have if in Vermont, if we were to approve every pending application, and it's over 600,000 square feet. Um, the target um, that our models called for um, is uh, roughly 450 to 500,000 square feet. Um, however, this target included a number of assumptions that aren't necessarily holding true. Um, first, uh, it called it suggested that we needed that much canopy if there is 80 percent of our licensees were indoor cultivators um, we're seeing a much stronger preference for outdoor cultivation um, and if this trend continues it means we're going to need to license much more canopy in order to meet the market demand um, also you know that 450 to 500,000 is assuming all of that is flowering canopy um, and that every licensed square foot is used for flowering canopy, and that's just not going to be the case. So I think we're actually in pretty good shape. Um, and of course, the picture starts to shift uh, if new things are allowed legislatively, um, things like delivery, high THC, solid concentrates, special events, and on-site on -site consumption. So the model is, is a very helpful uh, and powerful tool, but it really can't fully predict how this market's going to take shape. Um, on this last note, we're starting to put together ideas for a legislative action. Um, top of the list uh, for us is the medical program. Everyone here at the board recognizes that the laws regulating our medical program desperately need attention. Um, the board did some work on this last year with the help of our advisory committee, um, but it wasn't enough in the bill um, that we uh, suggested didn't actually go anywhere. So um, we're planning to continue our work on this issue during the summer and the fall and really have some concrete um, policy recommendations uh, for the future of this program. Um, also, the issue of high THC solid concentrates is a priority for the board. Um, you know, I actually think we got some good traction in the legislature this past session. Um, the conversation towards the end of the session started to shift from whether or not to do this to allow these high THC solid concentrates 
to how should the cannabis board regulate them? Um, things like, should there be serving sizes or purchase caps? Um, what sort of additives should be allowed and um, what the health warning should be? Um, we do have a report due to the legislature um, on this issue in December. Um, and we'll be kind of developing that report in conjunction with our advisory committee uh, throughout the kind of fall. Um, I'd like to continue to push for things like delivery and special event licensing um, on these issues. Again, it's not going to be good enough just for us to ask the legislature to do them. The, they really want to see um, what the regulations are going to look like and what sort of safety rails the board can put up to um, make sure things like youth access and highway safety are addressed. Um, so we'll spend some time this summer and fall thinking about those issues. Um, and then there's the vape tax. Um, this tax, uh, to be clear, is really an effective ban on um, vapes. It, it you know, puts a kind of intense premium on the cost of vapes. Um, and, uh, you know, what we saw with the Evoli crisis is that leaving this tax in place can really lead to real world negative public health outcomes. So this is probably another area where we should put our thoughts together for the legislature. Um, we also, this past week, got some questions about fire safety. I just want to remind everyone that the board cannot waive the requirement to comply with building codes and fire safety. This is a critical piece of the of our overall public safety mandate. Um, so I just want to repeat a few points on this. If you're Place of business is in a public building. You need a certificate of occupancy um, before we can grant you a license. If you're not in a public building, we need a letter from fire safety certifying that your location, your operating location is not in a public building. Landon Wheeler is your point of contact um, at fire safety. He really has done a tremendous job moving people through the pipeline. Um, but if you haven't spoken with him yet, please reach out. Um, DF, Department of Fire Safety, Division of Fire Safety responds to inquiries and permit requests in the order that they're received. So it's really important to reach out as early as possible. Um, his contact information is landon.wheeler at vermont.gov. His phone number is 802-639-0949. Um, he also attended a, a board meeting, a cannabis board meeting on May 31st to discuss the kind of process and next steps the second you reach out to them and what you can have um, ready to go in order to kind of help facilitate the process. Um, you should, if you haven't seen that, you should watch it. It's on our YouTube channel. Um, I will recap some of the high level points he made. Um, he can do that threshold analysis about whether you're operating in a public building offsite and he can do it relatively quickly um, for the most part offsite. You know, it doesn't always require a site visit. However, if you are a public building, um, you need to apply for a permit, um, which you can do at the Division of Fire Safety website, which is firesafety.vermont.gov. Um, he did also mention that uh, fire safety has a very good clearance rate. He said they get through roughly 95% of their applications within 30 days. So that's good. Um, fi finally, a uh, staffing update. Um, we've completed our interviews for our licensing staff and our compliance officers. We're in the process of extending offers and onboarding them, uh, these folks. Um, once they're here, I think it'd be a good idea, especially at least the compliance team, to introduce them at a public meeting um, so that people can really put a face to a name. Um, but it's uh, exciting. Um, that's it for me. Kyle, um, I was wondering if you might just kind of give us a status update on uh, packaging waivers and, and where where we stand. Yeah, absolutely. Don't everybody fall asleep on me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so we've got about 16. Actually, I think it is 16 because one was clearly, we have 17, but one was be testing it out and talking about dinosaur plastic. I think that they were messing with us, but uh, <laughs> Uh, we've got 16 waiver requests, and these are everything from drams um, that flour comes in to 
you know, the vessel that liquid concentrates come in, the vape cart, um, to droppers for tincture, um, to inserts inside of a container for, you know, shelf life stability, um, meaning like, you know, a little, like think about, you know, you buy fruit snacks from the store and they come in a little package. You would put that inside a different package. So we're, we're, we've gotten a lot of different parts of the packaging supply chain um, that we're looking at. I wanted to run through how we're, we're looking at these because we're not making decisions um, by the seat of our pants or, or out of thin air. We do have a scoring matrix that we're putting all of these through. Um, and there's five major buckets in this scoring matrix and each one is weighted the same. But I want folks who are going to be submitting waivers in the future to just understand how we're gonna be looking at and anticipating some of these rubrics. So for the first bucket is the effort that you're putting into your waiver request and taking what we're trying to do seriously. Um, you know, do you clearly state the need for a hardship waiver? Have you, are you demonstrating you've done adequate research to see that there are no reasonable alternatives out there um, other than the need for plastic? Um, have you considered the environmental impact that the cannabis industry has on our natural resources and our landscape, not just in Vermont, but across country and across the world. So, so those are the three main areas in that first bucket. Um, the second bucket is plastic percentage. You know, does, does this product intend to work with other products like wood, cardboard, metal, bamboo, um, or does it possess qualities to break down in a landfill quicker than your traditional petroleum-based plastic? And I know from folks that have submitted waivers that there is some cool technology out there. There's at least one company that's inserting microbes into a plastic that allow that plastic to break down in a landfill 75 to 80% quicker than a traditional plastic. And so, you know, if nothing else, this exercise is bringing these new innovative plastic concepts to the forefront of everybody's mind. Um, is, there, is there a clear need um, for plastic or rubber or something to achieve self, shelf life stability? We recognize that more often than not, it is. Um, but is there that clear need based on this packaging and this specific project? And you know, the last part of this bucket is, is it, is it truly de minimis? And de minimis is a legal term of art. It means a little bit something different to, to everybody. But if you look at this on, a, on the whole, is it truly de minimis and is it, or does it possess certain qualities that get away from how we typically view plastic and, uh, you know, uh, plastic breaks down under 1% over a four to five year span in a landfill. The next bucket is um, your business, your, the licensee or the prospective licensee who is submitting this waiver, your sustainability efforts as part of your business. Um, are you doing other things as part of your business model to offset the need um, for plastic? Have you demonstrated positive impact as part of your community and your business other than, you know, you might be required based on our regulations to do certain positive impact criteria, you might not be, but I wanna see, I think we all wanna see that you know you're looking to do above and beyond in some areas what our regulations um, account for at the at the floor level, and you know building off of that, are you building in triple bottom line benefits to your um, to your business? Are you holding others in the supply chain accountable? Are you looking at social benefits, environmental benefits, and economic benefits that kind of carry the torch and what we're trying to accomplish forward um, versus just kind of staying, you know, with the status quo and how some of these issues have been treated by other states, which is um, not not at all. And I know that there's some major markets out there that are looking at what we're trying to do here with, with open eyes to see if um, we can make any type of dent um, in the plastic issues that surround cannabis. Um, the, the, next, the next major bucket is product or brand sustainability. So the product, the brand that you're bringing to the conversation, I've had lots of conversations with a lot of different brands at this point, and I'm still waiting on samples from some of them. But, um, you know, a lot of very smart people, you know, the industry has either moved towards bio-based plastic, hemp-derived plastic, or PCR, ocean plastic. P PCR means post-consumer um, use. I can't remember what the R stands for off the top of my head. I'm sure somebody could, could correct me. But, you know, it's re post-consumer recycled plastic. That's what it is. And so that used to be a cheaper option than traditional plastic. But because consumers' preferences change, we're not relying as much on plastic at, at that point of consumer sales as we used to, you know, those costs are going up. So we know that these PCR ocean plastic um, is more expensive per unit. But at the same time, that's where the industry's going. 
Um, we're trying to recognize that because we're going beyond where the industry has kind of moved off the first generation of how cannabis is packaged at a retail storefront. So is the brand looking to move away from traditional petro-based hard plastics? Are they focusing on waste reductions um, through bio-based feedstocks or like, you know, microbe injections? Like I, I mentioned about at least one specific company that's looking to do certain things out there. Um, do they carry any certifications, um, either like an ASTM or TUV standard? TUV is a European certification that will um, yeah, certify a product as backyard compostable or biodegradable. There's some interesting bio-based polymers that are considered biodegradable and will degrade in a landfill just like it would in your backyard under very quick time scales. And those are the type of plastics because they are still plastic, even though they're kind of next gen bio-based plastics, they still would meet our definition of plastic um, that I think I would feel comfortable having in this. And I don't want to single out any specific companies. If you do your research on PHA, I'm sure you can find some, you know, we don't want to play favorites to certain companies, but we want to see the packaging that you're bringing into our market um, carries, you know, certain values that are representative of what we, what we carry here at the cannabis board. And the last major bucket is the need for this product in our marketplace. We recognize that this, again, is beyond potentially where a lot of the, the market currently is. If you have a dropper top for a tincture bottle, there's not really an alternative um, other than rubber and plastic um, to that, or you know, the, the rubber part of a plunger uh, for a syringe or, or something like that. We, we rec and, or a vape cart. We recognize there's some stuff that we can't put our heels in the sand and and really dig in here and, and we want to work with folks and recognize that. So, you know, does our staff agree that no reasonable alternatives exist? If this waiver was not granted, would this would a product essentially be mooted out of the market here? We don't want that to happen. And you know, does this product on its face or in effect reduce plastic and landfills? And so that's really how we make up that last major bucket. And all of this is scored, and we have a certain threshold that we want to see things scored. We don't want to pit products against each other. We want to, you know, look at a set of facts, do our research, get samples of it ourselves, and really look to, you know, put it up against certain things. Like I can say that we're um, still debating on um, internally how we feel about ocean plastic, you know, how that ocean plastic is sourced and tracked. There's some companies out there that do it a lot better than others. And at the end of the day, we might be taking plastic out of the ocean, but we're putting it into a Vermont landfill. And so we're still kind of working through the motions on, you know, how these would stand up um, on our scoring rubric, recognizing that it is, they are trying to accomplish something, but the devil is typically in the details. So um, I can say that we're, we're getting close to kind of getting back to some folks. The interesting thing here is recall my first bucket, which was effort in our waiver. We've had at least one example where we've had two individuals, businesses request a waiver for the same product. One might get a no because their effort wasn't very clear. They didn't demonstrate adequate, adequate research, um, although the product itself scores very well. Somebody else might have put a little bit more effort in, demonstrated that they've done the adequate research, provided us with facts that feel sufficient, and grant the waiver. The person who got denied would still be able to use it. So we might see some of those kind of situations happen. But again, every time we um, approve a waiver, we'll put that brand, that model number, and hopefully a picture if we can do it on our website so folks can kind of see exactly what's what's going on and what's been approved. Um, and again, I'm having lots of conversations every day with certain packaging companies trying to get the root to the root of what they're doing, what type of certifications they have, and reminding them that, hey, I know you're looking at this language. We need a licensee or a prospective licensee, um, not the business to you know, carry the flag forward for your product and, and request a waiver. So, and I've talked to, I'm sure, a number of folks um, on our call already about this, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with where things are. And hopefully by the end of the week, if not, you know, first thing next week, we can get some, some responses to folks. So I'll get off my soapbox now. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for bearing with me, but just wanted to remind folks that we do have a process on how we're looking at these. And there's just a lot of research that we're doing. We're not taking for granted this, uh, this requirement that we're asking of folks. So, so thank you. Yeah, it's great. It's a, it's a really complicated area of uh, kind of our regulations. Yeah, and and you know, I think the the, the challenging part is is that none of none of the eleven composters in Vermont 
are willing to take these, whether it's because they won't break down on the timeline that they can turn their compost back around into a consumer product or changes the acidity of the compost that renders it not as valuable to some folks that are using the compost. And, and traditional bioplastics like PLA made from corn break down the same as a traditional plastic in a landfill. So if they can't be composted, do they have a place here? Um, and so we're kind of trying to take everything on its face and plug it into our rubric and, and we'll start making decisions here soon enough. Yeah, and just uh, people are looking for that waiver form. It's on our website, ccb.vermont.gov slash guidance. Um, and so you can just submit your waiver requests. It is helpful for us to have packaging, a physical sample of the packaging, but we, it's not required, but it does speed, speed up our review. Um, Julie, I was wondering, um, I know that our point of sale flyer is almost done. Um, I was wondering if you could just kind of give an update on where things stand with that and sort of the process that you went through to develop. Sure, it's, it's gone to the Department of Health for one last pass comment. Um, we worked with the Department of Health on this. So the process has been that I, I looked back at our public comments that we received about this. I looked back at the conversations we had in our advisory committee and our public health subcommittee. Um, and then and worked with some members of the prevention community and then also um, folks from the New England Poison Center to sort of develop the language because I felt like they would be, um, you know, they had a lot of experience communicating to the general public. So the, the flyer was developed with the idea that people have already gone into a retail space, they've already chosen to consume, um, and they have likely are in the process of or have already made a purchase. And so that is sort of the basis of the flyer and the, the way that the communication um, is is written. It's We've worked with the Department of Health. I've worked with some other members of the public health uh, subcommittee and advisory committee on tweaking the language. And I think that we are almost there. And I think the plan is to go over it um, at a future meeting. Great. Great. All right. Um, well, uh, why don't we um, approve the minutes and then move to the agenda? Have you guys had a chance to look those over? Yes. Yep. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, I'll just turn things over to you, Bryn, for the um, kind of licensure review. Great. <clears throat> so our typical adult use pre-qualification and licensure register looks a little bit different this week at the outset because we've added um, some point in time data for the board to review regarding the medical program. Um, so this is sort of a first, um, you know, first attempt at providing some useful information to the board and to the public about um, what is going on with the medical program. And um, we can we can tweak this or change it however we see fit. Um, but this is um, a set of data that comes from the medical program just um, last week. So in the five days of last week, um, the number of new patient applications that were received by the CCD was 26 and 49 patient renewal applications. Um, we issued 70 patient cards. So you can see how quickly um, we are able to process those renewals um, and some of the applications as well. For caregiver applications, 16 were received last week and renewal applications, uh, 25 were received. Um, we approved five caregiver applications and to dispensary employee cards. Um, so this was all just in the span of five days last week. Um, and then just a few facts um, about our about staff um, processing. First, we have um, that the medical staff is currently processing applications that were received um, on June 21st and later. So our backlog is really not very long at all. Um, and then some point in time data um, showing the difference in the number of applicants, the total number of registered patients uh, this year as opposed to last year. So as of uh, July 11th, there were 4,321 registered patients, um, which is a little over um, 100 less, 200 less than last year at the same time. So July 11th of last year, there were 4,556. Um, some additional point in time data about registered caregivers. So this year, um, 
there were 376 registered caregivers on July 11th last year, 504. So again, about 100, 130 um, decline uh, as of as of this year compared to last year. Um, so that's a little bit of information about our medical program. Um, happy to hear feedback on that and what else the board would like to see in the weekly register. Any questions about that before I move on? I well, I remember that you did a survey um, a few months ago. Did that capture, you know, why like the difference in the numbers between last year and this year, like why there are 130, 200 less? Do we? So I don't think that the um, survey data drilled down that deeply. Um, it did demonstrate that there was overall pretty high satisfaction with the program. So. Um, I think that we can count on the bulk of that uh, loss not being due to any dissatisfaction program. Okay. Um, but I don't believe there was any additional questions that kind of identified specifically why people were dropping out of the program. I think with every adult, adult use state coming online, there's historically a dip in people on the, the medical registry, but it took a first reaction. Right. I mean, my assumption is that it's a combination of things, right? right. People either no longer have the symptoms or are no longer ill for whatever yeah. or they've passed away or, you know, right. could be a number of things. Okay. So I'll move on to pre-qualifications. We don't have any pre-qualification applications up for approval today, um, but here is the, here's a picture of our total numbers approved for pre-qualification. We're 216 ultimately. I don't think we're going to see um, many more. I think we have completed all of our stragglers up. Oh, sounds like we might have two more stragglers coming in, uh, maybe next week. Um, I'll move on to license applications. Um, so you'll see this is our, our uh, data set here. It looks a little bit different because we've split out now um, our cultivation tiers. Um, so they're no longer combined tier one and two. And we also have employee ID cards up here at the top. So we have some new information and also some additional statuses. You can see we've added the withdrawn status um, to the table as well. So um, see here, we've got 21 outdoor cultivators pending board review today, which is quite impressive. Um, and And this is the total picture here at the bottom. A little hard to fit it all on the screen. But you can see that we have um, nearly 60 um, applicants that have been either approved or had their license is licenses issued, up to 58 there. And we've got another 29 um, applications that are up for the board's review today. So I'll move on to that portion of the register. Um, as always, this list of applicants um, that staff is recommending for licensure have all demonstrated compliance with the requirements for a cannabis establishment license that's contained both in our rules and also in statute. Um, so I will go through them one by one. So first up, we have Birdman Incorporated. Second is Cleary Farm Cannabis, LLC. Um, third is Life Arises Farm. And, I will, and I'll mention the license type in tier two as I go through. So the first um, was an indoor tier one, second outdoor tier one, third outdoor tier one. Uh, number four is Bud Bird Farm, which is an outdoor tier one. Fifth is Dirt Rich Farms, LLC, a mixed tier one. Sixth is 1958, LLC, a mixed tier one. Seven is highly rooted, an outdoor tier one. Eight is Field Buzz LLC, an outdoor tier one. Nine is Tricome Vermont, um, an outdoor tier one. Ten is Grass Queen Incorporated, an indoor tier two. Eleven is Vermont LTC Grow, an outdoor tier one. 12 is Peanuts Garden, LLC, an outdoor tier one. 13 is Encore Herbals, LLC, an outdoor tier one. 
14 is El Pasic Farm, an outdoor tier one. 15 is Backwoods Cultivation, an outdoor tier one. 16 is Sun Roads Farm, LLC, an outdoor tier one. 17 is High Noon Cultivators, an outdoor tier one. 18 is Montwood Hollow, an outdoor tier one. 19 is Last Minute Farm, an outdoor tier one. 20 is Midnight Farm, a mixed tier one. 21 is Big Buds LLC, an outdoor tier one. 22 is Phytophysic LLC, an outdoor tier one. 23 is Canamentals, an outdoor tier one. 24 is Tea Time Herbal Company LLC, an outdoor tier one. 25 is Green of Green Farms LLC, an outdoor tier one. 26 is 45 North Nurseries, an outdoor tier one. Um, 27 is Serene Products, an outdoor tier one. <clears throat> 28 is Hidden Leaf Homestead, an outdoor tier one. 29 is Full Circle Farm LLC, a mixed tier four. And that is your list of um, applicants that staff are recommending for licensure this week. Awesome. It is awesome. It's awesome. Brookfields and some brain trees right in my backyard. It's great. <laughs> yeah, so that you can see the, the impact of staff getting through um, the entire list of outdoor cultivators last week. I have a whole bunch up for licensure. Not as much resources devoted to pre-qualification. Yeah, okay. I think it's thanks for uh, moving through the process a little easier for staff. So. Okay, so I'm going to move on um, to the social equity portion of our register. Um, so we have our numbers here. You can see um, one social equity applicant is. Um, their license is pending the board's review. Their application is pending the board's review. Um, and we've approved 11 and 13 have been issued. So the majority of our social equity applicants um, are in either incomplete or resubmitted status. So this week we have two recommendations for social equity status. Um, and we have two recommendations for denial of social equity status. So I'll start with the recommendations for, for approval of social equity status. First is submission number 462, which is an indoor um, tier three cultivation. Staff is recommending social equity status for this applicant because they meet the criteria for a social equity business applicant as defined in board rule. And second is submission number 536, which is an indoor tier two cultivation applicant. And staff also recommend this applicant for social equity status because they meet the criteria for social equity individual applicant as defined by board rule. Um, and here are um, recommendations for denial. So first is submission number 442. Um, and that is a mixed tier two cultivation applicant. And second is um, Submission number 467, which is a mixed tier five cultivation. Um, and staff are recommending social equity status denial for both of these applicants because they don't meet the criteria for social equity individual applicant as defined in board rule. Um, the second submission number on this list um, is an applicant that we denied at a, um, for social equity status at a prior board meeting. Um, and we are re-examining um, this applicant's case for social equity and staff has put together um, some information for the board for your review and um, the board may want to consider this applicant in executive session today. Great. So um, why don't we do that? Um, any idea how long? Um, you know, our executive sessions tend to take a little longer than we think they will. So I would say about 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Okay. 
Why don't we um, say 25 minutes and come back <laughs> at 2 o'clock? But uh, is there a motion to go into executive session? Uh, I move that the CCB go into executive session to consider confidential attorney client communications made for the purposes of providing professional legal services to the body. And that executive session is required because premature general public knowledge regarding such communications would clearly place the board at substantial dis disadvantage. I further move that the board invites Susanna Davis, executive director of racial equity for the state of Vermont, into executive session. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Okay. So we're going to move to executive session. Our goal is to be back at two o'clock. Um, again, we're going to hear some um, further detail from our staff regarding the, uh, a referral to the board to deny social equity status for one of our prospective licensees. Susanna Davis is going to join us for that conversation. So, Nellie, if you're ready, um, if you wouldn't mind putting up our away message or our executive session away message, and um, we will turn off our camera and video and um, have that conversation. Yep, I am just getting that up now. <laughs> yeah, just we won't make any decisions in that executive session. We'll hear the kind of advice and, um, and the reasoning behind the referral. And then uh, when we come out of executive session, we'll vote on whether we accept um, that recommendation or not. Okay, so we're back from executive session. Um, for the record, it's 2.04 p.m. Um, on July 13th, 2022. Uh, so really um, what happened there is uh, we had an applicant apply for social equity status under um, the criteria that the applicant was from a community that had been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition and the applicant himself uh, had been disproportionately impacted. Um, and so the board heard the staff recommendation, we heard some rationale, um, and I think we're ready to make a decision, but I would like to, just in case there is a, a split vote, I would like to just focus on approving the full license applications first. Um, so is there a motion uh, to approve the staff recommendations on licensure? I move that the board accept each of the recommendations for licensing approval as presented to us by staff in this meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Nine applications. Yep. It's a big number. Now, is there a motion to approve the staff recommendations on social equity status? I move that the board accept each of the recommendations for approval and denial of social equity stat status as presented to us by staff in this meeting. I will second. Favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, great. So the last thing on our agenda for today is public comment. Um, and we will do this the same way we always do. Um, We'll start with the folks that join via the video link um, and you, know, you can raise your virtual hand. We'll try our best to call on you in the order that you raised your hands. Um, we don't generally answer questions directly during these, but we do appreciate hearing people's questions because um, it helps to kind of build our guidance and, you know, oftentimes we'll address them at the questions that we get at the next meeting. But we'll start with people that join by the link. Please raise your virtual hand. Um, Nelly will call on you in the order that you raised it, and then we'll move to people who joined via phone. Uh, first, we have MT. MT, if you want to unmute yourself. seeing them come off mute now. All right. Okay. We can move uh, on and loop back to them. Um, yeah, Dave is back. next. Hi. Um, first, um, kudos to staff for getting through 29. Um, I can tell by the emails that I'm getting uh, that uh, these folks are working super hard, long hours. Um, so, um, you know, just it's noticed, it's appreciated. Thank you, staff. Um, on the uh, on Kyle's discussion earlier regarding uh, package approvals, um, what I'm getting from this is that you guys are going to be approving specific 
packaging, like manufacturer and model numbers. Um, and I'm wondering whether um, like substantially similar equivalents can also be assumed to be approved. So if, you know, you know, brand X uh, and brand Y, but it's really the same darn thing with the same specs, uh, whether that's something um, that the board could consider also allowing. Um, I'm, I'm throwing that out there. I, I didn't think of this myself until just now when Kyle was going earlier. Um, so something to think about, Kyle, maybe we can talk about it later, but um, I feel like there's maybe some burden on the regulators that could be lifted as well as some benefit to the, to the industry at large. So I'm throwing that out there. We'll talk later. Thanks, Dave. Tito. Tito, are you there? Oh, hi there. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Can, can you guys hear me? We yep. can hear you, yeah. Oh, good. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, I just want to talk about the vape tax uh, real quick since it came up um, and how it never was and is not intended for cannabis. And furthermore, the current dispensaries don't pay it on the exact same items that are sold in other stores. Um, I, I was working with this with Debbie Ingram years ago, and uh, she thought it was going to be as simple as just a rewording. And um, uh, then attorney, um, which she still may be, uh, Rebecca Wasserman, she also confirmed that this was never intended for cannabis. And then right before she was about to change the wording, Debbie Ingram didn't get reelected and then everything just fell apart and, and it was incredibly frustrating. Um, and uh, since then also, um, there's been this nationwide ban on jewels. I realize that's held up for a minute, but uh, you know, um, that's what this was really intended for anyway. So it's, it's almost like, the law that this was intended for, uh, the product this was intended for is already being dealt with separately. This is not intended for cannabis, um, but short of running for office, I just don't know what else to do. That's all, thank you. Thanks, Tito. Ben. Good afternoon, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we yep. can. Great. Well, hey, uh, thanks uh, for keeping up all the good work, you guys. Uh, it's much appreciated by everybody. Um, my comment today is about um, some testing requirements. So I've started uh, a certification agency for uh, cannabis growers in the state it's called Green Star Vermont. And um, I've had some clients approach me. Um, there is at least one other certification agency, uh, which I will not name, that is claiming that um, if you are part of its program and, uh, and you do get your certification, that after you've gone through your pesticide testing and all of your heavy metals testing, that um, with that you will not need to get on every single cannabis sample uh, the whole panel for pesticides and uh, heavy metals if you've gone through that uh, program. And uh, I communicated with you guys and you told me that such a thing does not exist. And I was just kind of looking for further clarification on this point um, for myself and uh, the clients who are asking me about this. Thanks so much for everything you're doing. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, anyone else who joined by the link, uh, just feel free to raise your virtual hands. And um, you know, once we get through you, we'll move to the folks that joined by the phone. Uh, Yarim. Yes, hello. Yarim Plenty is with Red Clover Analytics. Uh, one thing with the THC caps and other ammunition that you can bring to the uh, to the state is that uh, yeah, the THC caps again I, it's going to put put uh, unnecessary burden on any manufacturer uh, because if it comes up uh, if they bring up the product to our testing lab and it's over 60%, we're going to have to turn around and tell them that uh, this product has to be, you know, uh, treated to lower the, the THC amount. And then they're going to have to come back, and then we're going to have to do 
a full panel testing again on that same product because the product that they added to to the the, the THC high product um, to lower it uh, may not have been tested before for these things that we're looking at. So we are looking at double testing everything that is over sixty percent, which means that now we're talking about a thousand, close to a thousand dollars per product that it's uh, that is manufactured. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on is I do I was looking myself for some clarification about the green green certification. Um, as I, I as I know, you guys have nobody yet certified to be able to have a sort of green clean a, a, a green grown certification through you guys yet uh but that's all that i have but thank you very much thanks here so anyone else who joined via the link um just raise your virtual hand but we'll move on to people that join via the phone um if you join by the phone and have a public comment, um, just hit star six to unmute yourself. Nelly, are you seeing anyone unmute? I am not, no. All right, then we will close the public comment window. Um, Kyle, did you want to respond to any? Yeah, I can respond to the, the plastic conversation and, and David's point well taken. I, I think it's a, you know, and, and we can, I'll talk here, but we can we can talk offline too. I think it's it's a careful balance on on doing as you suggesting, as you're suggesting, for instance, let's say somebody puts forth a mason jar with a screw top with a little bit of plastic to seal, or it has a buckle. Another person puts forth a ball jar with the same type of set of facts and situations. I, I can see that being something that you're you're pointing to and wondering if it's necessary. But if we're thinking about, you know, more plastic being used than that, it, it and even if it's the same feedstock, a lot of the, you know, sourcing of that resin or, you know, there's a lot of proprietary information that goes into making a lot of these next gen products. It's kind of hard to kind of situate similar similarly situate you know two products but but i think your point is taken at points of the supply chain and i think we can we can make that determination um you know when it's necessary i haven't seen any kind of duplicative i've seen the same product come through on the waiver form i haven't seen two that are so similar um you know from a mason jar ball jar kind of you know example um Come forward yet so i guess you know i'll give you the lawyer answer back it depends <laughs> um on the on the pesticide language you know and and we put that language into our, our regs to kind of help alleviate some some costs and i've talked with some experts and some certifiers um that work in the cannabis space and and those that work outside the cannabis space to kind of understand what we should be looking for because i don't want to steer anybody to one specific company i will say nobody has achieved that certification um ben so whoever is telling folks that i hope that they they stop until they actually get that um okay or that green light from the board but it's going to come back to what iso you know certifications you either have or work towards you know your your background your expertise your demonstrated you know ability to succeed in doing so and I, and I know that you're saying you're starting a company and that's really exciting and i'm not trying to moot you out of that conversation by any stretch but we're going to need to see you know what what your company's mission is and what certifications you have or are working towards um to to give us that trust to to know that it is pesticide free um and a lot of it will boil down and you know I'm hopeful that you can talk with Kerry Jaguer when he starts on Monday. A lot of it's going to be boiling down into how we really, um, I think, define and look at the word pesticide and, and what that actually means. Because even organic pesticides, depending on how broad you, how broad strokes you want to, um, you know, utilize that definition, um, and it'll, it'll be hard to be completely uh, pesticide free in some in some cases. But again, it boils down to some guidance decisions that we have to make. And we'll have some guidance, hopefully coming out of our compliance team on how to achieve 
that certification because I, I, I full know, and I'm sure everybody else does that's listening, that that's one of the most expensive parts of, of getting your product tested. So, um, you know, more to come, but nobody has achieved that, that standard with us yet. All right. Um, while we're at the end of our agenda, any final concluding thoughts? I think there are final. I think there might be another licensee that was left yes. off the list. Okay. Inadvertently. Okay. One that's being recommended for approval. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Out of Bryn left. What kind of? Can you <laughs> yep. give the information? If you are okay with that, Mr. Chair, that's. So we have, so yeah, essentially um, I'm getting word that we uh, inadvertently left one application off the list that is ready to go. And so if you can just give us the basic name of the company and um, the, the, the tier, um, the type of license and uh, where, where it's located, we will vote to approve or deny based upon the staff recommendation and Two. Outdoor cultivator tier two in Irisburg. And the business name is Wana Ventures LLC. Vermont Wana Ventures LLC. It's a standard application. Okay. Um, and the recommendation from the staff is to approve. Okay. Uh, is there a motion? I move that the board accept the recommendation of the staff. Okay. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so that is not reflected on our registry right now, Correct. but it will be before we post it for our, for our on our website. It also makes an even 30, right? Yeah, for all you folks still listening. <laughs> got 30 today, not 29. <laughs> all right, and is that, we didn't have to call in question? No, it was, part of the agenda was already approving the okay. staff's recommendations, so it's fine. Okay. Well, thank you to staff for flagging that so we can get this person moving through the process. Um, today instead of next Wednesday. So that's exciting. Thank you. 30's the new, I won't say it. No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I don't have anything else, so I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you all for attending.